Hello and welcome to the Atoll, your home for Waterworld fandom. On today's collecting video, we'll be taking a look at all the various versions of the Waterworld novelization, as well as some of the key differences between each individual book and the film they're based on. So without further ado, let's jump right in. The first book we'll be taking a look at today is the full paperback novelization of Waterworld, written by Max Allen Collins and published by Boulevard Books in 1995. Collins is best known for writing mystery graphic novels, having penned Dick Tracy material for many years, and then most famously writing the comic book series Road to Perdition, which was adapted into a 2002 film starring Tom Hanks, Paul Newman, Jude Law, and Daniel Craig. Though Collins did not only write mystery, and his breadth of work is actually quite diverse having worked on novels, comic books, comic strips, trading cards, short stories, screenplays, historical fiction, video games, jigsaw puzzles, and of course, movie novelizations. And movie novelizations are sort of a strange breed of publishing unto themselves. They are basically book-length descriptions of a film, reversing the more familiar practice of adapting a novel into a film. Movie novelizations saw their heyday before the time of streaming and DVDs, when the only way to bring home a favorite film was through a book. Even in the 80s and 90s with home video, movie novelization still proved popular, perhaps due to the longer period of time in between a film's theatrical run and its home video release. And interestingly, Collins is in fact a co-founder of the International Association of Media Tie-In Writers, an organization of writers which celebrates the business, history, and craft of media tie-in writing. It's also curious to note that tie-in writing is often overlooked and underappreciated, which I think is misguided, considering it represents a huge percentage of books published each year. And movie novelizations can really be their own experience, allowing authors to tinker with the material and flesh out the worlds being created, or allow greater insight into the character's inner thoughts. In Colin's own words on tie-in writing, the joys of movie and TV converge with our love of storytelling in prose form. We want more of our favorite characters and relish a novel's ability to invite us to climb inside the story and not just passively watch it. And I believe that the novelization of Waterworld delivers completely in this way. Looking at the book itself, it's actually kind of a cheap paperback, known as a mass market paperback, with a fairly plain front cover displaying a photograph of the Mariner and this nicely embossed Waterworld logo. On the spine of the book, we get the same logo and a small rendering of Enola's tattoo, along with the author's name. On the back cover, we have a photograph of the Mariner Helen and Enola from the film. The back cover blurb sets up the post-apocalyptic universe that Waterworld is set in and gives a brief introduction to the Mariner and the dream of dry land. But more interestingly, what story is contained within the pages of this 324-page novel? Well, in large part, it's very similar to the film as you might suspect, but there are many differences as well, which for us fans is really the most interesting part of reading this book. And it must be noted that nearly every page in the novelization differs from the film, from small details in the dialogue and world building to whole additional scenes. And this is due likely to the fact that Collins was writing the book before the completion of the film and basing it largely on a work in progress script. Even during the filming of the movie, the script was being reworked by script doctor Joss Whedon, so it's no surprise that these differences would arise. And of course, some of the differences also are because of Collins just adding his own creative interpretation on the material. So there's no way I could call out every little difference between the novel and the film since there are so many, but nevertheless, I would now like to run down a list of my 40 favorite differences, so let's go. Number 1. The novel begins with a quote from the poem The Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner. This comes up a little bit later, so keep it in mind. 
Number 2. Before Chapter 1 even begins, we are given a prologue from an unknown narrator that is addressing an audience that they call their children. This narrator describes a world before the Great Deluge, the time of the ancients, and sets up the story that is about to be told which focuses on the Mariner. But who is this unknown narrator? We will discover this soon enough. Number 3. Now for some finer details. The Mariner uses fish eyeballs instead of steel balls to control his diving timer. Number 4. According to the novel, the design of the water purifying system was sold to him at an atoll from an old trader. Number 5. The atoll elders wear seaweed gowns and dried jellyfish hats. Number 6. There is more explanation to why dirt is so valuable in Waterworld. It represents a hope and longing for dry land and even the smell of dirt is described as being intoxicating to the inhabitants of Waterworld. And it is also implied that the elders use the dirt in their rituals. Number 7. The Mariner often uses the phrase crabs of hell as a sort of curse word used throughout the novel. Number 8. The book describes Enola as looking Nepalese in the scene where we are first introduced to her. Number 9. When the Mariner is captured by the Atollers, he loses his shell earring and Helen retrieves it from the dock. A small detail that you think is going to pay off later in the book, but never does. Number 10. The Atollers catapult live jellyfish at the invading Smoker army. Number 11. The Priam is killed during the Atoll battle and therefore is not one of the captives that is interrogated by the Deacon in the manufacturing plant after the battle. Number 12. After the Atoll battle, the smokers put captured children into shackles to be sold as slaves. Number 13. The smokers have tugboats which they use to tow the damaged attack boats back to the Ds after the Atoll battle. The tugboats appear at the end of the novel to assist with the moving of the Ds after the Deacon has declared that he has found the map to dry land. Number 14. The dock wheels around a gas tank with tubes that extend permanently into his nostrils. This tank contains a cocktail of various intoxicating gases that he adjusts according to his mood. Number 15. There's a whole additional scene in the book after the Deacon meets with the depth gauge where the smokers are gathered in an indoor theater watching a John Wayne film, which from the description sounds like the film Flying Tigers. In this scene, the deacon addresses the crowd and reveals his ultimate dream to build an 18-hole golf course on dry land. He then instructs his smokers to go hunt down Enola and incentivizes them by declaring the first one to find them will get a VHS about Operation Desert Storm. Number 16. The deacon's quarters are described as being an enormous ballroom with a glass chandelier hanging from the ceiling and a Rembrandt painting next to a poster of Elvis, who they believe is a religious icon from the land days. Number 17. The Mariner is especially cruel to Helen after she harpoons the smoker Skyboat, threatening to cut off her other body parts after he has already cut off her hair. However, in the novel, he does not cut Enola's hair. Number 18. The tomato eating scene is thankfully much shorter than it is in the extended cut of the film, leading us to believe that this scene might have been one of Joss Whedon's rewrites. Number 19. The Drifter's dialogue is significantly different in the book. Director Kevin Reynolds said that actor Kim Coates brought a lot of his own ideas of how to play the Drifter, so I suspect that he went off script when giving this performance, leading to a notably different portrayal of the character in the book. Number 20. Enola gives the Mariner his name, Mariner, in the book. Helen notes that it comes from an ancient poem that Old Gregor would recite, this of course referring to the rhyme of the ancient Mariner, which is quoted at the very beginning of the novel. Number 21. In the fishing scene, the Mariner squeaks like a dolphin to lure the whale fin to the surface of the water. After harpooning the mutant sea monster, the book describes the Mariner cutting himself out of the skull of the beast. Number 22. Enola does not hum the music box theme throughout the book, rather she sings a song about a girl in the wind, and the music box plays this same song at the end of the book. Number 23. 
Surrounding the barter outpost, there are cages floating around it filled with human slaves. There's also cages underneath the barter outpost that contain tracker sharks. Number 24. As the Mariner Helen and Enola are escaping the ambush at the barter outpost, the Mariner is not shot by the Deacon like in the film, but rather shot by a random smoker with a quote, two-shot mounted spear gun helmet that is clinging to the underside of the trimaran. Shout out to the Mad Max Minute for pointing this one out to me. Number 25. In the underwater city, there is no nuclear sub or ski area like in the film. There is, however, a Nordstorm department store and coffins lining the streets. Number 26. The Trimaran has many secret compartments which the Mariner stashes items in. This helps to explain why the Mariner has so much supplies after his boat is looted during his imprisonment at the atoll. Number 27. The book goes into way more detail about the Mariner's prized National Geographic magazine collection and reveals that some of the magazines are from 1999, in the future when compared to the book's 1995 release, and all of the articles in these magazines are about climate change. After the smokers catch up with the Mariner and torch the Trimaran, the Deacon steals these National Geographic magazines for himself. Number 28. When the Mariner and Helen escape the smokers, the book says they stay underwater for over an hour and are very far from the ruins of the Trimaran when they come back up to the surface. Number 29. The Mariner reveals to Helen part of his backstory and what his childhood was like. I go into far greater detail about this in my video on the Mariner's origin story, so be sure to check that out if you want more information. Number 30. In the book, it is implied that the Mariner is a virgin, and Helen is the first person he has ever been intimate with. Number 31. The doc gives Enola a shot of pufferfish venom, which is meant to work as a truth serum but instead just makes Enola babble about how the Mariner will save her. Number 32. In the book, the Mariner is keeping handmade charts plotting all the major cities he explores underwater. These charts lead to a large reveal about why Gregor is unable to decipher the map on Enola's back, but I'll have to go into greater detail about that in a future video, all about the mysteries of Enola's tattoo. Number 33. The book makes no reference to Old St. Joe or the Exxon Valdez and replaces the smoker's religious deity with a more general god they call the Provider. This is most likely due to the fact that the filmmakers did not know until the very end of production whether they would be able to legally use Exxon or Captain Joe Hazelwood in the film. Number 34. There is an additional scene in the book where the smoker skyboat lands on the deck of the D's and is stopped by a giant rope held by over a hundred smokers. Number 35. The Deacon kills the smoker skyboat pilot to make room for Enola in the two-seater plane. The Deacon also kills a smoker jet skier just after he falls into the ocean. In the film, the jet ski is just floating by itself when the Deacon happens upon it. Number 36. The Dees has a launch ramp at the end of its deck in order to fling the smoker skyboat into the air. Number 37. The book exposes that the Deacon is a pedophile, and as the Dees is sinking, he makes a quick plan to escape with Jesty Nola on a quote pilgrimage for two, you and me and a bungalow in dry land, nothing improper, husband and wife, with the provider's blessing. Number 38. The human skeletons found on dry land are blackened by disease, hinting at some sort of plague that killed the inhabitants of dry land. Number 39. It is revealed that the Mariner is going off to search for other Mutos like himself at the end of the story. This would also become a central aspect at the end of the Children of the Leviathan comic book series. He also tells his companions that if he finds other good people in his journeys, he would send them to dry land. Number 40. Finally, in the epilogue of the book, it is revealed that the unknown narrator introduced in the prologue is in fact Enola as an old woman. And the fact that she is addressing a group of children tells us that society on dry land has begun to rebuild. She also hints at the fact that the Mariner may have returned to dry land during her lifetime and that this was a story for another time, leaving room for a possible sequel. 
So there you have it, those are my 40 favorite differences between the book and the film. But do you have any other differences that you like or any important ones that I missed out? Let me know in the comments down below. But regardless, the novelization of Waterworld is an absolute must-have for any Waterworld fan. It's a pretty wild read at times, or just an interestingly tweaked interpretation of the material, so if you haven't already, I would highly recommend picking up the novel for yourself. But now, let's turn our focus to the other versions of the novel. That's right, Waterworld actually received several different versions, starting with this young adult version published by Red Fox Books, a children's book division of Penguin Publishing. The young adult Waterworld novel has a very similar cover to that of the full novel version, but uses a more comic book sans style text and no embossing on the logo. You'll also notice that the book is larger in dimension but slimmer in width. The back cover blurb also sets up the post-apocalyptic universe of Waterworld, but this time, very interestingly, the blurb introduces us to Enola as the main character of the story. This is most likely done to entice a younger reading audience. Also on the back cover is the price of the book, which is only in British pounds, leading me to wonder if this was an exclusive to the UK. Opening up the front cover, we find that this book does not have a named author, rather that it was adapted from the Max Allen Collins novel. So, in short, this book was adapted from a book that was adapted from a screenplay for the film Waterworld. And yes, this is truly a slimmed down version of the full novel, with larger text and only 106 pages. And not only does this version have much simpler language and sentence structure for a younger audience, but actually whole sections of the story have been removed, such as the deacon's interrogation scene, the drifter scene, the barter outpost slash slave colony scene, and all of the scenes aboard the D's up until the scene where Enola is imprisoned. And, of course, any mature content has been altered or cut out of this version of the book, even much of the violence. For instance, the book avoids any reference to the Mariner actually killing anyone in the story. When the Mariner runs down the drifter at the very beginning of the novel, he waves a scolding finger at him rather than using the cutthroat gesture. And he also does not have any final confrontation with the Nord at the end of the book. Also gone are any explicit sexual references, like when Helen offers herself to the Mariner, or the cringe scene where the Mariner barters Helen's body for a canister of paper, or the scene where Helen and the Mariner eventually make love on the ruins of the Trimoran. The young Adele version also does not make any references to the purifying of urine. But one addition that the young adult novel has over the full version of the novel is this wonderful section in the middle with full color images and captions. This is a really nice addition to the book and I especially love these aerial photographs of the atoll docked in Kauai Harbor. And looking through this photo insert section reminds me that this was actually a very common feature in these young adult novels based on movies, serving as an enticing little promotional look at the movie that the novel is based on. And I would have to say that perhaps the young adult version of the novel is not an absolute must have for all Waterworld collections, so if you're looking to pick up one book, I would recommend the full version as it has much more detailed world building in it. Though I do find that it is a very fascinating artifact being that it's an adaptation of an adaptation, and looking at how Red Fox books chose to work around the more mature content made it an actually pretty interesting read. The final version of the Waterworld novel that we'll be taking a look at today is the rarest and most unknown of all the versions, that being the audiobook version published by Cinema Sounds, a company that specialized in audiobooks of movie tie-in novels. Looking at the front of the packaging for this audiobook, we are given the Mariner under Setting Sun image that is present in much of Waterworld's promotional material. At the top of the front cover is the Cinema Sounds logo, along with their slogan, Let us entertain you. Listen to the movie. And at the bottom are the credits for the writers, Max Allen Collins, Peter Rader, and David Tui. But also, we are told this audiobook is performed by none other than Artie Call, the actor that played the Atoll Enforcer in the film. Truly a treat for any fan of this film franchise. But I would just like to note that this is actually not Artie Call's only Waterworld tie-in project, as he also reprised the role as the Enforcer in the live-action cutscenes in the PC game, Waterworld, The Quest for Dry Land. 
On the side of the packaging we have the title and again RD Call's name, along with this image of a dual gun wielding smoker which originally comes from this production still from the set of the film. On the back side of the packaging is a nice variety of images from the film and a description of the opening events of the story and the dream of dry land. Under the description is a dashing headshot of R.D. Call and a synopsis of his acting career. Under that are the actual credits for the film. Opening up the package, we are welcomed with a very simple inside, with just some legal information and the two audio cassettes in their own sleeves. The tapes themselves are plainly printed with the title, Artie Calls Credit, and Cinema Sounds logo, along with Soundlines Entertainment logo, which is the parent company to Cinema Sounds. Though I actually have to note that I own another variation of the audiobook packaging. This one uses a plastic case to hold the audio cassettes instead. The printed parts of the packaging however seem oddly stretched horizontally, resulting in a more stout looking mariner face on the front cover. The plastic packaging itself is brittle from age and falling apart in a few places. I believe that at one time this may have been a loan copy at a library because it has this plastic pocket in the back where a catalog card most likely was placed. Most interestingly about this version is this sticker on the front that warns audiences that this audiobook contains adult content that is not advisable for younger listeners. And the sticker is correct, the audiobook version of Waterworld is much more comparable to the full version of the novel over the young adult version of the novel. Intact is nearly every scene, mature content or not, that is present in the full version, along with some select sound effects that add to the thrill of the audio experience. However, the content of the audiobook is abridged, cutting out any extra wording or areas of excessive description. This slimming down of the book was likely done in an effort to fit the entire novel onto two audio tapes. And I actually have to say, I really like this abbreviated version of the novel because it creates a more streamlined experience and cuts through some of Max Allen Collins' more indulgent prose. However, the audiobook does decidedly cut a few scenes from the book, like the community meeting at the atoll, the mariner getting harassed by the gang of atoll boys, the second urine purifying scene, the hair cutting scene, the mariner reading his National Geographic scene, and the reveal that dry land is the top of Mount Everest. Also, very oddly, the epilogue is cut from this version, meaning we don't get the reveal that the Mariner's name is Ulysses or the fact that the old woman narrator is actually Enola in the future. But you're probably wondering what exactly does RD Call sound like reading the novelization of Waterworld? Well, let's now have a listen to some selected sections of the audiobook. A yellow stained glass beaker at his feet was no challenge for an aim long since perfected. His urine arced and it splashed into the glass was as gentle as that of the lazy waves his ship cut through. Soon he rebuttoned his pants, cut off jeans, much older than he, and plucked the beaker of precious yellow fluid from the deck and proceeded to his homemade water recycling system. In a watchtower through a viewing scope a watchman kept watch. Something was visible, tendrils of smoke curled skyward seeming to rise from the water. Smokers! the watchman screamed. Out on the crimson gold water, the mariner was swimming easily on his back, and Enola was gleefully sitting on his chest, riding along. The screams had been squeals of pleasure. For the next hour, she watched as their gruff captain gave the child a swimming lesson. Several days later, the little group in the armor plated balloon drifted into heavy cloud cover. The mariner, steering, guided the airboat down, and as the balloon emerged from the clouds, a tropical mirage displayed itself before them. It was an island. And there is just a taste of the audiobook. I've actually digitized and mastered the entire audiobook, so if you'd like me to release that as its own video series slash playlist here on this YouTube channel, please sound off in the comments below. But regardless, I'm very happy to own these two variations of this rare collectible, and considering there's no information about it currently on the internet, I'm proud to have presented here this lost artifact of Waterworld fandom. But there you have it, that is my look at all three versions of the Waterworld novelization along with the key differences between them individually and the film that they are based on. 
please, if you enjoyed this video, consider giving it a thumbs up so that it will get recommended to more viewers. And if you haven't already, I would greatly appreciate your subscription to this YouTube channel. We are currently pushing towards 1,000 subscribers and have many videos planned for the future. So by subscribing now, you will be part of the growing success of this channel. Also, feel free to follow the ATOL on Instagram for more Waterworld content. Link in the description below. But with that, thanks, as always, for joining me at the ATOL.